the next hour, you will be listening to Living Now with L. Nathan Hare. The phone lines are now open at 837-1112, and we encourage your questions and comments. Now, without further ado, here's your host, L. Nathan Hare. All right, here we go, Living Now, Living Right Now. This is L. Nathan Hare, your host here for this next hour at WFO, 10 at a.m. on your, excuse me, yes, uh, uh, not 1080, 96.5 FM uh, on your dial uh, from 10 from uh, 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock this morning. Our principal sponsor, of course, the Community Action Organization of Western New York, still fighting the war on poverty, now in our 52nd year. Uh, this is L. Nathan here, your host here. Uh, I want to welcome you, uh, excuse me, for uh, all of you again to this hour of insight, introspection, and interpretation of facts, events, and trends affecting you right here and right now uh, in Buffalo and Western New York community and, in fact, community communities all across the country. Each month, we focus on things we think will be of interest to you, which will serve to interest you and will serve to motivate you. Excuse me, am I, ooh, I'm having gas for some reason or other. It serves to motivate you. Uh, and, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 to connect up to the broader issues that affect our communities here in Western New York. Uh, as the spirit moves us, we'll break into our regular format to discuss timely issues and circumstances that we just can't uh, responsibly avoid. And what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be having a conversation with Dr. Umar Johnson, who is a, uh, a, a school psychologist. And he is uh, an author of, of the book, Psychoacademic Holocaust, and I think we got him on, right? Dr. Johnson, are you there? Yes, sir. Good morning, my brother. All right. Dr. Umar Johnson, he is a school psychologist, author of the book, Psychoacademic Holocaust. I got the title right? Yes, you do. Okay. He's been championing the effort to get parents and responsible officials to recognize and resist what he refers to as the war against black boys. Uh, he has dedicated his career in fighting the psychoacademic war on the side of uh, on the side of African American boys and uses his experience to educate parents on how they can take charge of their children's education. He urges the community to take a stand to change the disproportionate graduation rates of African-American students, especially black male students who have the lowest graduation rates in the country. Dr. Johnson, when I was looking at your, your text, uh, Psychoacademic War, that refers to a war being waged by the public education system against young children and, and uh, uh, children of African a uh, ancestry uh, in the United States, particularly African boys, what exactly do you mean by that that, that phraseology, the psychoacademic war. Yes, sir. Uh, in conversation, I genuinely refer to it, as you stated, as the psychoacademic war. In reality, as the book is titled, it's really a psychoacademic holocaust. When uh -huh. you talk about a war, war implies that there's two sides engaged in a struggle. A holocaust implies that there's only one side engaged in the struggle mm -hmm. and the other side unfortunately has been victimized because it doesn't recognize that in fact there is a war taking place against it so because we're not fighting back it becomes a holocaust and not a war but there's six stages in this war against black children mm -hmm. boys in particular miseducation stage one they deliberately miseducate black boys mm -hmm. special education stage two they deliberately misdiagnose on purpose black boys with such glow-in-the-dark, cannot-be-proven disorders as reading disabilities and math disabilities and ADHD and conduct disorder, which takes us to stage three, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. debilitating psychiatric medication. Now the Ritalin comes in, the Adderall, the Concerta, the Cyclot, the Metadate takes us to stage five juvenile detention and incarceration that's when the drugs has fried the young man's mind so much he's not able to function anymore so now they send him to the juvenile detention center and then that takes us to stage five which is psychological frustration and alienation this is when he becomes the so-called thug Mm -hmm. the angry black male and then that takes us to stage six premature extermination at the hands of another black male off, also suffering the debilitating effects of the psychoacademic holocaust mm. 
That is just so depressing to hear. <laughs> but the thing is, here, here, let me tell you what's so depressing about it. Not that it's happening, but because the African-American community has the financial and intellectual wherewithal to reverse this problem, eliminate it completely on its own. We are a trillion-dollar economy. In 2016, we spent $2 billion on Air Jordan, $600 million on McDonald's, $9 billion on Perm and Weave. In 2016, Black America purchased twice the amount of Mercedes Benz's as white America, although white America has more than twice the amount of wealth as black folk. So we clearly could solve this problem on our own, but the truth of the matter is, the Department of Education don't care much about black children, but neither do black people. And you know, Dr. Johnson, that is so uh, profoundly insightful. We do a lot of discussion about these kinds of issues on this program. And one of the things that I just want our audience to just wrap your mind around this reality, African-American people as a whole have a gross domestic product. You know, in other words, you add up all savings and income and uh, you know, uh, real estate and all that stuff that belongs to African people together. It comes to $1.7 trillion. Now, now, I don't know how many people get their minds wrapped around trillions, right? But trillions is a lot of money. That's a lot of zeros, right? And when you talk about that kind of money, if we were an economy, a, a national economy, we would be in the top 11 economies on Earth. It would seem to me that if we could just make a decision amongst ourselves, which I know it's not as easy as it is to say, but if we could make a decision amongst ourselves to stop looking for other people to do for us and just invest in ourselves, make sure that all of our children have uh, African adult that is around them almost all the time. If you have almost no, as a child, you have almost no completely unsupervised time. When I say supervised, I don't mean somebody holding your hand. It's somebody who's in the area that you're in. So when something happens, there's somebody to intervene, right? If we could keep us around caring adults all the time, we would get wired into thinking that being safe as a child is normal. I think that we think being safe as a child is abnormal in lots of parts of African communities around the country. Does that make sense to you? Oh, you're absolutely correct. In fact, I would argue that in the post-Dr. King assassination era, these uh, 49 years or so, because we'll be celebrating 50 years this coming April 4th, 49 years since the assassination of Dr. King has been the period of the normalization of dysfunction in black mm -hmm. America. We yep. have normalized dysfunction. Police genocide is now normal. Uh, teenage pregnancy is normal. Only one out of every four black boys graduating from high school is normal. Mm -hmm. White Jesus still in our black churches is normal. We have normalized the dysfunction of our community. Yep. Do Dr. Johnson, we have uh, uh, Patricia Elliott. Uh, I don't, you, can't, you just have to kind of, well, uh, I don't know if you, if you can hear on, on, on your, uh, your, your set. We have, Doc, we, we have uh, Patricia Elliott, who is the assistant director of our Better Schools, Better Neighborhoods initiative, who's joined us in the studio. Uh, she's the one that sort of found you for us, <laughs> so we wanted to give her an opportunity to talk. What our Better Schools, Better Neighborhoods initiative is about is exactly what you were talking about. How do we marshal the resources of ourselves? to help us do the one thing you, you know you can win on if you do it right. If you get your kids through the education process where they come out on the other side able to go into a, or a conferring or a vocational certification program uh, without re requiring remediation, you spent your 13 years of education of your child wisely. If you don't get that done, you might as well just throw that money in the wind. <laughs> and so we try to work on the, 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 the how do we help the community to get better, so that we can help us educate our kids better, so that we can grow a better pie uh, for all of us. So, Patricia, can you speak up? Can you, can I can you? try. Can you hear me? I can hear your voice, but I, I can't. Uh, you're, you're, uh, kind, you're kind of, of far. Yeah, see my headphones aren't working. Try, yeah. try, this, try this one over here and see if you can hear, hear it now. Can you hear me? Still can't hear? Sure. Try, uh, yeah, you guys sort of switch around your mics. There you go. Can, can you, you hear me now? now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, go. good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. 
Excellent. I can barely hear. I can't even hear or anything. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, I want to say good morning. Thank you very much for coming on. Um, whew, this is a heavy topic of discussion. Mm -hmm. um, our children are at stake here. Um, what's going on in our education system with the way things were created to bring our children down? I mean, children being placed in special education, um, the district suggesting to parents that your child needs special education. And you, you know as a mother, your child doesn't. That's the conversation I can bring because they tried to tell me that about my daughter. Mm -hmm. And it's just not true. It's just not true. You know, Dr. Johnson, you, you raised a point in, it wasn't in the book, or it might have been in the book, I don't know if I saw it there or if I saw it in one of the articles that I read on some of the speeches that you have, you have given, but help, help me understand if what I'm thinking makes sense. I get the understanding that if a child is placed in special education, the district gets about twice as much money for that child than they would get for a child who was not in special education. And that, uh, now this may just be the cynical person in me, so if I'm wrong, you can tell me, I, I, I can take it, right? But it, it, the impression I get is that districts are putting kids into special education unnecessarily because there's sort of superficial things that are going on that allow them to be able to mark that child for special education. The district then gets, you know, twice as much money for those kids then provides low-budget kind of services, special ed services, because the kids don't really need that much service. And then they take the, 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 the surplus and use that to flush out their general fund and, you know, balance their books. Now, that sounds like a very cynical way of looking at the world, but I got to ask you, Dr. Omar, am I, am, am I making sense, or is this just the, the cynical nature in me? It's not cynical. It's truthful. It's truthful. I mean, I've been a school psychologist going on 20 years here, 17 plus three years of study. That's exactly what's going on. And I've seen it from the East Coast to the West, to the Midwest, to the South. Special education is a business and it thrives off of the marketing job that school districts do so well selling those dysfunctional services to black parents. I mean, let's just think about it. And this is one of the reasons I'm coming back to of Buffalo, New York on Saturday, September the 9th, and I'm really hoping that the community comes out to get this information because the last time I was in town, which was only one previous time, two years ago, at the uh, Frank Merriweather Library, everyone couldn't fit inside because right. of the space. So, this so you know we, we, there's a mother load of uh, people out exactly. here that are concerned about this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So this, you know, September 9th, we want all the parents to come out. We want all the children to come out. We want the elders, the activists, the politicians, the preachers. Mm -hmm. We want them all to come out. But if I'm a parent and I'm uneducated about special ed law, I'm uneducated about special ed process, if a teacher, counselor, nurse, principal, psychologist, reading specialist comes to me and say, your son is struggling, but we have a program to help him, and if you put him in this program, it limits the amount of days we can suspend him from school. Mm -hmm. It limits our ability to retain him mm -hmm. from moving up in grade. It gives him a smaller class size. It gives him a slower pace of instruction. Mm -hmm. It gives him more time to take his test. Mm -hmm. The way they market special ed powerful. to black parents makes it seem like it is a blessing when in all reality it is a curse. It and I call it that because it is the central pipe mm -hmm. in the school to prison pipeline you couldn't have a school to prison pipeline without special ed there you go. here's the fact that everyone needs to uh wrap their minds around the average reading level of an african-american male inmate in america's prisons and jails is third grade mm. third. Mm. the average mm. grade at which a black child is referred for special ed is also the third grade special ed has been kept concealed as the chief conspirator towards the school to prison pipeline. Now you know, go ahead. I just wanted to say that's the grade that, that my daughter was said to have been ready for special education. And for me, um, I said to them, you know, okay, I was a younger mother, this is my 30 year old daughter now. Mm -hmm. um, when she was a child, they recommended her to special education. Um, they put her on medication, something called Silert something called Siler, and 
they're, they're telling me that this is, I went to an IEP meeting, and they're telling me this is what was best for my child. And I'm a young mother. I'm married, mm -hmm. but I'm a young mother. And I'm looking at these people, and I'm saying, okay. So I go for it. And I let them give my daughter this medication, and when... I saw what the medication was doing to my child. Mm -hmm. She had all kinds of nervous tics. She could not function properly. She These was angrier than drugs. Right. ever. Right. And I took her off the medicine. I said, you know what, this is done. I told my daughter, I said, baby, you all right. You're no longer sick. You don't need this medicine anymore. And I took her off. So I need for Dr. Uh, uh, Johnson to help people understand. I, I had a, a, a girl in 1990. 90, 90, 90, uh, who was in one of my preschool programs at Erie Community College. And I couldn't even test her. She was so slow, I couldn't even test her orally on a California achievement test. She just couldn't respond to the test. It was clear that there was something that was, there was like a resistance in her. It wasn't that she didn't have the innate intelligence to learn, but she didn't have the ability to, to handle being tested. Something, it's like, almost like hormones, you know, uh, erupted inside her, something like that. But anyway, when, when I got her, she was 18 years old. They had given her what she thought was a high school diploma. Please don't laugh about this, right? Oh, she, she got one of those leather. Doctor, you've seen these things, these leather books, and it says it, it's got like a, a sheepskin in it, and it has like a seal for your local school district on it. But if you read it, the word graduation does not exist on the document yeah. at all. It was really a certificate of attendance, right? And uh, yeah. I had to take this child. It took me almost two years. For being untestable, I actually had to hire somebody for two hours a day, five days a week, for two years to get her to the point where she could read it better than a seventh grade level and count at a, at a sixth grade level, which was like miraculous. She's still working for the uh, HSBC bank, you know, right now. Um, and it was only because we were able to do that I had the authority, you know, at ECC to be able to move those kind of dollars for this single child because you couldn't teach her in a group session. She just couldn't, she couldn't respond to that. But I, I say that to say that even the, the children who test where they may appear to be retarded in the test often are not really retarded. There's something inside the child that reacts to what you're doing to them when you're testing them. And so they just don't respond to the test. But it's not like the child doesn't have some, there's, there's intellectual stuff going on in the child's head. The child's just not giving it to you. Am, am, am I on something there, Dr. Dr. Johnson? Oh, yeah, absolutely correct. Testing in and of itself is an issue because, first of all, it is based upon an erroneous philosophy that you can reduce the quality and quantity of a child's learning to a number. It's just like the fallacy of the intelligence quotient. If you're giving out an IQ test, it's based on the assumption that you can quantify a qualitative subject. Mm -hmm. You cannot reduce to one number the brilliance and intelligence and the complexity of a child's intellect and take all of that and reduce it down to a single score. But this is what white folks do. They love to quantify things that cannot be quantified. But mm -hmm. the reason it's done is because in a society based on racial privilege and in a society based on class structure, you have to justify why the rich are rich and you have to justify why the poor are poor. So this goes back to the early eugenicidal foundations of American social beliefs in, in, in practice, which is to say that they justify why the top 1% of Americans own more than half of the wealth of the entire country by saying they were more intelligent, they were more brilliant, yeah. they excelled better in school. And when you look at the poor, especially black folk, they will say, well, you know, they're intellectually, you know, backwards, they're half monkey, right. you know, they're not right. as intelligent right. as white children. So to make a long story short, testing in the 21st century serves the same function as the Jim Crow sign did in the 20th century. Yeah. And that is to say that testing is the new way of denying opportunity to black people without saying it's because you're black. You just simply say you didn't score high enough. Right. This they, is how they keep us they, out of the fire make department. It, make it a meritocracy. This is how they keep us out of civil yeah. service jobs. This is how they keep our children out of prestigious universities. The test score is the new Jim Crow sign. Instead of letters, they use numbers now. Yeah. Dr. Johnson, I want you to hang right on. We're going to have to take sure. a, a moment 
and, and pay, uh, take care of our sponsors because they pay for the program. So if you all just stick with us, we will see this out of the break here at Living Now, Living Right Now. No, he, he, he said he could keep him on. Okay, cool. So how's it going so far? What, the, the, mm -hmm. yeah, we're, we're getting to it. We're getting to it. We still don't know whether he's a doctor or not, but we're, we're getting to it. <laughs> Never mind. I hear what you said. He's, he's such a smart alley, you know. You starting already this morning? <laughs> Who, me? I'm curious if you started already. See, that's, that's, that's how he roll, you know. <laughs> see, he says smart alley stuff and don't even know he said it, you know. <laughs> Okay, we have a caller. WFO 96.5 FM on right. your dial. Uh, and we're here, we're having an, a, 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 a remote, I guess, whatever you call it, interview yeah. with uh, Dr. Umar Johnson, who is the author of Psycho um, uh, Academic uh, Holocaust and is really uh, uh, championing us gra gra grappling with the reality that our children are under attack, particularly our African and male children are under attack. And that this is a systemic situation that is going on, and we're going to have to respond to it in a very systemic way. So, uh, Dr. Johnson, we have uh, 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 Eva Doyle, who is a longtime educator. She's been she was an educator for about 33, 34 years. She's been retired for about eight or nine years, but she's not really retired because she's been teaching she's on her in PhD. the community ever since then, and she's working on her PhD right now. So, I want to get her thoughts and and, and your thoughts to uh, to her thoughts. Mother Doyle, are you there? Yes. I'm, I'm calling to say hello to Dr. Johnson. <laughs> hello, Queen Mother. Glad to hear your voice. Listen, when, I, when he came to Buffalo two years ago, I hosted him at the Larry Weather Library. He was talking about that. <laughs> yes. And, and, and listen, he calls me Mother Doyle also. There you go. And, yeah, Do, Dr. Johnson, it's so good to hear your voice. I don't, I don't have anything to say except I want to correct one thing. I've been retired 13 years going 13 on 14. Years. 13 going on. And, and, and I want to say this. I, I, when I taught in the schools, I very seldom referred children to special ed mm -hmm. because I knew what was going to happen. There were so many teachers who were so lazy, who didn't want to challenge our children and teach them the correct way. But I don't want to take up, I'm going to be there at the church to listen to you. I'm going to cover you for the criterion. I just wanted to say hello and welcome back to Buffalo. Queen Mother. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to seeing you as well. Excellent, excellent. D D Dr. Dr. Johnson, this whole issue of IQ tests, you know, I found that to be very intriguing because I took an IQ test when I was maybe seven years old and they said like I had 140, you know, IQ and I took another one, you know, about six or seven years after that said like I had 147, 148 uh, uh, IQ and so on. I didn't understand what that meant in the context of me learning. I had people that were better at chemistry than me, you know, they weren't as good at, ge at trigonometry, but they were better at chemistry than me, you know, it's, I, I didn't see what the connection was between what these tests were and what I was actually doing in school. And I wonder if what you were saying seems to me to, 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 to explain that what they do is they, they create something that sort of makes a fake meritocracy out of, out of, out of academics. You know what I mean? If you perform well on the test, you earn the right to be treated correctly in the education system. And if you don't perform well on the test, it's because of you. There's something wrong with you, and that's why we're not going to give you the quality education that we're going to give to other people. I hope that that's not what's going on, but that's my sense of what, what, what is taking place. Am I, am I on the money on that? Oh, you're absolutely on the money. Instead of looking at the test, and saying, why is it that African-American children categorically and systematically score lower than white children? Let's look at this test and see why an entire race of children are doing less well than another race. 
instead of saying let's look at the test, they say no, we're going to blame the children. But what I want to add to the conversation is that that 15 point test gap over which so many conversations and panels and debates and discussions have been had was deliberately created. That was not an accident of testing. The test was created, again, to justify the racial hierarchy, Mm. to justify white privilege. We need to understand something really, really well here. If black children categorically outscore white children, let's just say for the rest of 2017, black children are showing that they are 10 to 15 points smarter than white children. America has a major problem on its hands. Why? Because if black children are more intelligent than white children, how do we justify so many of them in prison? Mm -hmm. How do we justify that you only have one black working on a doctorate at this university, another black in law school, only two of them in med school, only a couple in the engineering program? How do you keep Harvard all white? How do you keep Yale all white? Mm -hmm. How do you keep the University of Pennsylvania most prestigious elite academic graduate programs? How can you keep them all white when the black children are clearly more intelligent than the white children? They can't have that, which means the test must always produce a false positive suggesting that whites are more intelligent because that's the only way you can protect and maintain the American racial hierarchy as it is today. Once black children outscore white children, it will cause a social revolution. And because of that, I can promise you, you will never see a test Mm -hmm. that shows black children outscoring white children. You will never see it. Because the minute black kids exceed white kids on any test, that test is destroyed and a new one is replaced. Mm -hmm. Yep. Dr. Johnson, I want to kind of spin us in a slightly different direction because I think that some of what we're talking about is sort of systemically deliberate and some of what we're talking about is maybe quasi deliberate but it's almost like an unintended um but real consequence let me tell you what i'm talking about i was doing some analysis on who actually teaches us in at the elementary and high school level and at the numbers i looked at for the year that ended uh school year that ended for 2013 was that almost 82% of all of the teachers in the uh, uh, public school system, elementary and and, uh, high school, were Caucasian teachers. And even some of those Hispanic teachers are actually Caucasian teachers that just happen to speak Spanish. I I don't know, some people don't know that speaking another language is not the same thing as being a a different race. But that's that's another conversation. That's that's too hard for us to to, to work our way through. But my point is that 76% in that analysis of all teachers were were women, and 82% at minimum of those women were Caucasian women. So that means better than 60% of the people who are teaching our kids are Caucasian women. Now, we've gone through this civil rights revolution in which the primary beneficiaries of the civil rights revolution have been Caucasian women, not African people, even though it was supposedly a struggle for African people's rights. It's Caucasian women who seem to have benefited the most by that. And a culture, I think, has formed uh, among women that is manifested in the women that teach in the school systems where the male children are looked at as perpetrators and the female children are looked at as the victims or future victims of the perpetrators. And that that gets into how things are talked about. Women, female children are being encouraged to go into, you know, math and science and non-traditional this and that. And the boy children are treated as if, well, y'all always been there, so we don't have to do anything, you know, to help you. That's not a very scientific way that I express that, but does that make sense, the, the, the thought process that I just provided there? Oh, it, it, it most certainly does. And I think, obviously, because white females are a protected class in the United States, and because they are a protected class in the United States, we, we rarely, we seldom have open, honest conversations about the role of racism in education. Nine out of every ten articles, news specials, uh, interviews, or books operates from the premise that there's something wrong with the child and the family, and that's why black children are struggling. Because they are protected class, white women have never, nor will they ever, be held responsible for their role, and in particular, their racist attitudes and how that affects the outcomes 
of black children, even though university research coming from America's most prestigious universities clearly shows that there is racial bias in the classroom. And it clearly has demonstrated consistently over the years that a child's academic output and their quality of growth is directly a result of the faith and the quality of instruction and the attitude that were projected to them about themselves by their white teachers. Mm -hmm. And I would say that one of the greatest conspiracies and oversights of the civil rights and affirmative action movement has been the fact that neither the civil rights bill nor the efforts of affirmative action, which we know has benefited gays and white women more than it has ever benefited black folk, but yet and still never sought to eliminate the racial bias in teaching employment in predominantly black school districts. I mean, how can you talk about eliminating discrimination in public accommodations and services? I mean, you went to the military and you did it there. You went to the Greyhound buses and you did it there. You went to the hotels and did it there. You went to city government and you did it there. But they never brought those types of promises into the school system. When they integrated our children beginning in 1954, they left the teachers behind, mm -hmm. and no one has ever dealt with that. And, and you, you know, know that's, that's so interesting, interesting because, because it, 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 it brings to mind a paradigm that was taught to me by James Foreman, the uh, author of the Black Manifesto. He taught me this back in 1970. He said, be careful who you ally yourself with. <laughs> because sometimes the people who seem like they're on your side, they have their own issues, their own agenda. And you, you end up having to carry their agenda as baggage, you know, behind you as you're trying to move forward. So you have Caucasian women who obviously have been discriminated against and, and marginalized in many ways, even though they were half the custodians of the wealth, you know, of Caucasian people. They were marginalized in, in, in many ways. They were allowed to vote until whatever it was, you know, to, uh, 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 19... What was it, 1920, 21, whatever it was, 1960. Marginalized, but never dehumanized. But never dehumanized. Marginalized, right. but never dehumanized. Right. But, but we wind up carrying, they, they, they were wound up, you know, being a, a part of the uh, ideation of what the civil rights movement was all about. Mm -hmm. And because they were so able and, and had large numbers and they had access to everything because they were married to everything, mm -hmm they were able, you know, fairly quickly to get a lot of momentum going their way, and we were less likely to react against them because they were supposedly more uh, positively oriented towards the African Civil Rights Movement. And so we ended up, you know, not looking at these people that we thought were our allies. Maybe they weren't really our, our allies after all. I, I'm just... Positive, positing that out there for you, Doctor <laughs> Doctor Jackson. Sometimes I hate you know saying this stuff because it sounds like I'm so cynical about things. I, I, I'm I'm just trying to real. help us to you understand real. that there are dynamics that are going on here that Doctor Johnson is trying to point out to us mm -hmm. that we have to grasp in our heads mm -hmm. why these things are so important. I'm not mad at somebody else. I understand they're fighting for their own interests. Mm -hmm. But I got to fight for my own interest, okay? <laughs> I can't not fight for mine because I'm trying to protect yours. Yes. Uh, Dr. Johnson, help me. Pull me out of the basket that I'm putting no, myself I, in. <laughs> I, I, absolutely, um, I absolutely follow you on that. I think one of the ironies of the black struggle as it relates to education or any other aspect of our reality is that whenever you do put you know, the issue of race on the table as a serious catalyst for many of the problems that African people face here in the United States and throughout the Western Hemisphere, you will get black people who voluntarily, without training, license, or degree, will stand up and defend white people without even being asked to do it. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we're going to have to deal with going forward is how do we neutralize that element within our own community, which is hell-bent on protecting racism as a way of protecting the crumb that it has received from the table of racism. In mm -hmm. other words, there's no scholar in America, in his heart or her heart, who doesn't absolutely know that black people are never going to get equality in this country unless they're willing to pay the price for that. Okay, they know this, mm -hmm. but yet and still they would argue that marching and protesting and voting and praying will change things. They know it's not the truth, but it protects 
whatever benefits they have gained, it protects their job. It protects their retirement. It protects their child attending a, a, a privileged, prestigious white school. It protects whatever monies that they're contractually obligated to receive from the power structure. So a lot of us, out of our own selfishness and out of our own greed and narrow-mindedness, we will defend racism, not because we believe what racism says, but because it protects our own estate. Yeah. Trisha, you something you wanted to, to plug in there? Yes, I've been wanting to plug in for a minute. Um, I'm a mother, and and I'm just going to represent black mothers, just mm -hmm. sitting here. I'm just typical black, black mother, single, working one job, and raising children. And we have to deal with the teachers in the school as it relates to our children. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when our children are so-called misbehaving or not getting it or having these issues, and these teachers are recommending that our children be sent to special education or being told that our children is bad or being told that something is wrong with our children. We, black mothers, have to deal with these white teachers, white, white people in charge of our children. We have to co-parent, not co-parent, but co-educate our children. If you are educating my child and you don't have a care in your heart for my child, you're just here doing a, a, a six, seven hour stick, you know, you don't, you don't take my child home with you. And so when, I, when I'm trying to um, how can I, I'm trying to say this, black women are the most endangered group in the world, what I'm saying is. So when we complain or when we talk about our issues to the teacher who we're trying to have uh, a connection with for our child, they don't really recognize our situation. They don't really, they say, well, you should have, you should have, but they're basing that on their, um, their socialization, mm -hmm. where they're coming from. Um, they don't live in our community, they don't shop in our community, they don't work in our community, and our children engage them only from this point to that point. So how can you decide for me that my child has a problem or there are, there are problems with my child, and how can you decide that for me? I'm sitting here wanting to fight right now. So I want you to turn this around for Dr. Johnson. Uh -huh. And given that reality, mm -hmm. okay, you mm -hmm. know, your children are literally in enemy territory right. when they're in these public schools yeah. and so on. But you can't change that reality. Right. They're going to be sent, and you're going to send them into enemy territory mm -hmm. every single school day. So given that, mm -hmm. what should parents and the community itself be doing to bond this so that we can make this you know, my, my, my uh, first wife used to always say, you know, take lemons and turn them into lemonade. How do you turn this into lemonade? Well, for me... Well, one of the... Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. One of the things that I'm going to be discussing when I do come to Buffalo on September 9th at the St. Luke AME Zion Church, I'm going to be talking about an organization I started a year ago now. We're a little more than a year old. The National Independent black parent association mm -hmm. and actually our next training conference will be in north carolina on the 15th and 16th so i'm hoping i can motivate some of the brothers and sisters in buffalo new york to join me in durham north carolina to get the necessary training from me that allows them to go back home and operate that chapter because one thing we have to do we have to organize i can't tell you how many times i've been involved in assisting parents and advocating for children where only to find out after dealing with one situation, there were four, five, six, seven other parents in the same school with the exact same situation, and in many cases were in the same classroom as this parent's child. Mm -hmm. And it bothers me because what it says is we're not organized. There's nothing more powerful than to walk into a principal's office and say we have an issue of white teachers singling out black boys for punishment. If I say that for only one black boy, the teacher and the principal and the assistant superintendent is going to automatically say, you're making an assumption. We don't have this problem with other black children. We only have it with her son. So mm -hmm. this ain't about race, it's about him. But mm -hmm. when I come into the classroom and there's four or five parents who are all saying the same thing is happening, it is no longer about individualism. And we now have to address the issue from a systematic institutional mm -hmm. perspective mm -hmm. and that adds to our power mm -hmm. to leverage that situation so we got to organize mm -hmm. stokely carmichael said it the best if you organize a little you get a little done if you organize mm -hmm. some you get something done mm -hmm. but if you don't organize at all you don't get anything done mm -hmm. and i would say as marcus garvey said a hundred years ago the greatest weapon used against the negro is disorganization yeah. wow. any problem we have 
is multiplied tenfold by the fact that everyone dealing with that same problem is not operating in a system of oneness and unification. Yep. Listen, I, I, I don't know if I had given the number before to the program, so we usually get a, a few more callers uh, calling in. The number again is 837-1112. That's 837-1112. Trish, you had something you were about to plug in there? I was just going to say that, um, you know, Dr. Johnson, you said it, white women are protected. Um, they're protected. This position as being a teacher is a protected position. Um, black women who are raising their sons, we're not protected. We're out here fighting on our own in a lot of ways. Um, and, and even I've read somewhere recently that when uh, you see black people struggling, white people don't really recognize it as a struggle. Well, that's not that. You know, they don't have a real first-hand understanding. It's, it's just theory for them. But they're, they're making decisions and, and making laws and putting in instant injustices or whatever you want to call it against our, our babies. You know, how can we work with that? I say parents, mothers, you know your children. Don't let anybody tell you something's going on with your child without you talking to your child first and understanding your child. That's what I have to say. We have to listen to our children as mothers. Dr. Johnson? I absolutely agree with that point. Mm -hmm. Now, you asked a minute ago, what are some things parents can do on an individual level? Obviously, we need to operate on the group level, but what they can do on an individual level, three quick things. Number one, don't find anything unless you read it thoroughly and understand it. Mm -hmm. and that makes a lot of sense, but guess what? Most parents do not read things thoroughly, and they mm -hmm. still find them even when they don't understand them. And the reason they do this is we love to give the schools the benefit of the doubt. We love to give the teachers the benefit of the doubt. One of the reasons we got so many black children in special ed, even though we didn't think nothing was wrong with our children, because somebody who doesn't even live with us told us that they need special ed, we went ahead and agreed giving them, once again, the benefit of the doubt. You cannot afford to give the school the benefit of the doubt. The school plays a central role in the maintenance and perpetuation of white supremacy because it prepares black children to fail. It prepares black children for that position that the American social order has already predetermined they should, uh, they should obtain. Number two, okay, a parent has to get comfortable saying no. Thank I've you. noticed Thank in my work that black parents, mothers and fathers, are very uncomfortable saying no to white people. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's anything special about the school system. I think this goes back to four centuries of indoctrination when we were absolutely made to feel mm -hmm. that we were inferior and that the white man is superior in anything that emanates from his or her mouth is the gospel truth. Mm -hmm. So we don't feel comfortable rejecting the advances of white people. Mm -hmm. Learn how to say no in defense of your child. And then the third thing that black parents need to start doing let me say stop doing, and that is going to school meetings by themselves. They need to start going to school meetings with someone else because schools are bullies. I know. I work in them. Schools <laughs> will bully you just like a gangster would. They like to get the single black mother coming in there by herself. So the principal and the vice principal and the dean of students and the classroom teacher and the reading specialist can gang up on her. And because they're white and have more college degrees than she has more often than not, she once again gives them the benefit of the doubt. Never, ever go to a school meeting by yourself. Bring two, three, four, five other people with you. Bring relatives. Let them know that we are a family. Nothing worse than a single black mother who shows up either telling them outright or evidencing through her behavior that she don't have any support. A single black mother without support, her kids are destined for a life of special ed and low expectations. So I, I want to put a, a, a scale on this problem. I want to numerically, <laughs> okay, I know we were talking about you know, numbers a minute ago, but I want to scale this for us. Roughly 16 to 17 percent of all children in, in the public school systems in the United States are black children, right? When we look at the number of children who are in, uh, what the, are children who, have, who are uh, uh, identified as having what they refer to as an educable mental retardation. Don't get mad at the word. I'm, that's, that's the word that they use, the clinical word, mental retardation. 37% of all of the kids who are identified as having an educable mental retardation, meaning that you could teach them in a regular classroom, are African children, 37%. We're only 16 to 17% of the student population, 37% in that category. Mm. In the category of children with trainable, um, a tra a trainable as opposed to educable, 
trainable mental retardation, like you see with the kids at Goodwill and whatnot, mm -hmm. right? That mm -hmm. you can teach them how to yeah. how, how to pull the carts and whatnot, mm -hmm. you know, at, at, at Wegmans. Mm -hmm. Stop laughing, okay? 27% uh, of those children who are identified as trainable with uh, a trainable mental retardation are black, and 27% of the children who are identified as having serious emotional disturbance 27% of them are black in a population in which only 16 to 17% of the total population is black. I just want you to understand the scaling of this problem. This is not just people saying stuff because they superficially, you know, see things, you know, in the classroom. This is their numbers. These are not Nate's numbers. This is from the National Center for Education Statistics. This is not Nate's numbers, okay? So, so Dr. Dr. Johnson, uh, we have a caller hanging on. Ho hold on one second. Bring that call in. Sure. Hi, caller. Are you there? Yeah, yes, sir. Blessed love, family. Hey, brother. Come on. A couple of quick questions. Sure. Um, they have a lot of nice-sounding kind of uh, terms and phrases and models and mission statements. Like the mission statement of the Board of Education is putting students and families first to ensure high academic achievement for all. They have something here in New York State called the Dignity, Dignity for All mm -hmm. Students Act. Uh, my question is, uh, if not special education, should we have specialized education? Because not all students learn the same way, and we need to teach the way students learn if students aren't learning the way they teach. So how can we take control over the development and education of our own people? Good question. Dr. Johnson? My answer to that would be no other aspect of education is more important than the personnel. We mm -hmm. can focus on learning styles. We can focus on teaching methods. We can focus on the pedagogy. We can deal with the instruction. It will not matter because the person teaching the child doesn't care about them. Yeah. In other words, you guys know I'm in the process of building the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. Mm -hmm. Imagine I got two teachers for the same position. One of them has all the degrees, all of the degrees. Other one is fresh out of college, very little experience. But she is absolutely optimistic about her ability to impact them children. Guess who I'm going to go with? I'm going to go with the one with the heart. Mm -hmm. Because as we know, and the research shows us, it is the teacher's belief in the child's ability to learn which is the single most important predictor of classroom achievement, not the pedagogy, not whether or not they're teaching black history, you understand, mm -hmm. not, not the instructional methods, not specialized learning, her faith in the child. The tree will only grow if it's nurtured with faith. Mm -hmm. yep. Just as in church, the same thing in school. If there is no faith in those children's ability to achieve at a high level, they won't. So more than the paperwork, it is the personnel. If I got to choose between great teachers and a lousy curriculum or a great curriculum and lousy teachers, give me the great teachers and the lousy curriculum. Why? Because despite the curriculum, a great teacher who has faith in her yes. students is going to make sure they learn irregardless of what's on paper. Yep. The personnel matters more than anything in print. That was revealed in the research of uh, Leon Pettigrew, who, who wrote an analysis on the Col Coleman Report. And what he said was that if you go to, you could find in the South those one room schoolhouses where you had nine classrooms, you know, being, nine grades being taught in one room. And those kids were graduating, you know, uh, 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 getting through school, going on to secondary school, and going on to, uh, to college. Uh, in spite of the lack of resources, because of the passionate commitment that the teachers had for those children. So it wasn't about, you know, whether or not you had the best, you know, chemistry labs and, you know, swimming pools and a nice track, you know, on campus and whatnot. It was about the, the teachers. If the teachers really wanted it and the principal was really the education leader of those, uh, of those children, people become what they hear. And if you're the important person in somebody's life and you're the one that's constantly, you know, helping people to understand what they can be, they will turn into what you are directing them to turn into. And if that's not where you're coming from, the kids will turn into people who are not, 
you know, turning into what you say you want them to uh, to turn into. I, I, I think that that's, that's the answer to Kamal's question, Dr. Dr. Johnson. I think you're right on the money on that. And I would also add that we need to be clear that although we appreciate it, and I largely support the Adam Clayton Powell, Charles Hammond Houston's uh, NAACP uh, Legal Defense Fund victory in the May 17th, 1954 Brown versus the Board of Education Supreme Court decision, but we need to also be conscious that there were educators and scholars who did not agree with the need to integrate the schools or desegregate the black schools. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of blacks who opposed it. W.E.B. Du Bois opposed it. Zora Neale Hurston opposed it. A lot of prominent blacks opposed it. They didn't see it as necessary, and they thought that it would lead to ultimately detrimental outcomes, as we can plainly see. And one of the reasons that they desegregated them schools had nothing to do with giving black children equal access mm -hmm. to a quality education. They were afraid at the type of inventions and achievements that black people were accomplishing mm -hmm. in those underfunded, dilapidated, one-school public housing. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you realize we invented the gas mask mm -hmm. in the stoplight? Two-thirds of our inventions came before we could sit next to white children. And so America was threatened at the intellectual achievement of black children, and they desegregated the schools so that they could supervise the learning, mm -hmm. dumb it down, and also draft those black students who they could use to help maintain white supremacy over African oh, people, i.e. Barack Obama, i.e. Colin Powell. So they would, they never integrated the schools to help us. They integrated the schools to help them control that us. That's true. I, I think, think we have a caller hanging on here. Let me see, see, see if I can grab that call real quick. Hi, Hi caller, are you there? Uh, good morning, Nathan. How are you? Hey, Bob. Uh, quick uh, couple of points. I uh, was going to ask the doctor, um, what he thought about uh, things like ar arsenic, lead, mercury, over vaccinations, if that's playing a part uh, of what's going on. And uh, moreover, I think it's the system itself. I told you that uh, part of my family had to move into a new school system to get uh, the type of education that they were looking for. And I will re, re uh, say something. I told you that I was once told uh, teacher gets paid whether I learn or not. So uh, mm -hmm. it was up to me to receive the education. But I think it's more of what the doctor says. It's the dumbing down of America. And, uh, Nathan, uh, you said something in the beginning of the program uh, about wrapping your mind around something. I'll just say to you, my friend, is try wrapping your mind around the sun and see how big that truly is. <laughs> God bless you, my friend. I'll listen <laughs> and uh, talk. You later. Okay, I'm not going to wrap my mind around this Sunday. I'm going to stick right down here. <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Johnson. Well, he's absolutely correct. I definitely believe that. Well, we know statistically, we even know. And now we, from the Food and Drug Administration a couple of months ago, they finally admitted, although they didn't fully admit, but they admit that certain, certain immunizations have mm -hmm. been related to an incidence in autism. They didn't say all immunizations, when the truth of the matter is the whistleblowers, former researchers from the FDA, have confirmed that almost all, at least multiple, immunizations actually trigger autism. But we do at least have an admission that at least one or some uh, immunizations trigger autism. If you go back, okay, I'm 40 years old. I went through my entire grade school education without a single autistic classmate. I'm sure the same is true for you all and for most of your listeners. Exactly. But I, was I was going to school, there was no such thing as autism. <laughs> exactly. But the children today, the average black child gets at least one autistic classmate every single year. Mm -hmm. And that is because of the immunizations. They are more toxic than ever before. So, of course, someone would ask the question, if the immunizations are leading to autism, why stop giving them out? Well, there's two reasons for that. One has to do with capitalism, and the other has to do with accountability. The reason why they cannot stop the immunizations is because if they admit in court that these immunizations are primarily responsible for the rapid rise of autism, you have a situation where nearly every parent in America could sue the government for knowingly subjecting their children, okay, to chemicals 
that clearly cause harm. Mm -hmm. That is a clear violation of the 14th Amendment, equal protection, mm -hmm. okay? Not to mention other aspects of the Constitution, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. So that is a legal nightmare for the United States government. The only payout that would be greater than a class action payout to the parents of autistic and thought to be autistic children would be reparations for enslavement of African yeah. people. Yeah. And the second reason why they will never admit that immunizations cause autism is because it's a billion dollar industry. I mean, you're actually selling to the government a chemical that every child born in this country, black, white, Latino, Arab, East Indian, whatever of their racial background, if they're born in this country, except the parents who are smart enough to fight back, they will get this. Do you know how much money that is? You don't even have to market the product. It's guaranteed because it's being forced down parents' throats by the government. Yeah. So greed and accountability is the reason why this monster called immunizations will never stop. And on top of that, there's no long-term evidence, no long-term conclusive evidence that shows children who are immunized are healthier than children who yeah, are not over their life term. Dr. Dr. Johnson, I want to get one more call in before the end of this hour. Let me get that call real quick. Hi, Hi caller, are you there? Good morning, Nate. How you doing? All right. How, How you doing? doing? Okay. I just want to uh, just say uh, I'm glad to hear this doctor uh, speaking about what I knew when I became an administrator in 1991. Buffalo Schools is aware of uh, learning styles and the uh, effect of medication on the kids and so forth. And so we're dealing with a different uh, generation of parents. And uh, thank God for you for having this brother on the air to deal with this uh, new generation of parents, to let them realize uh, the racism aspect is still going on in this day and time. God bless you. All right. Thank you. And Dr. Uh, uh, Johnson, let's tell people again, we're going to be at St. Luke's uh, AME Zion Church. This is going to be on September 9th. Mm -hmm. What time is that going to be? Uh, 4 p.m. Doors open up at 2 p.m. The address again, St. Luke AME Zion, 314 East Ferry Street, F E R R Y. All children, 17 and old and younger, excuse me, all children, 17 and younger, are absolutely free. All elders, 65 years of age and older, absolutely free. They don't need a ticket, they just need to have ID confirming that they're 65 and older. Everyone between the age of 18 and 64 will need to get tickets, and they can do so through my website, drumarjohnson.com, or they can go directly to Prince of Pan-Africanism, and we spell Africa with a K, Prince of Pan-Africanism.eventbrite.com. They can also text my phone for the flyer or the link. 215-989-9858. I repeat, 215-989-9858. Excellent, excellent. And if you don't know where uh, St. Luke's is, okay, that means you probably don't live in the African part of Buffalo because we all know St. <laughs> Luke's, okay. <laughs> but if you don't remember, near Lons, right in the corner of Lonsdale and uh, East Ferry, that's a block off of... Block off of Jefferson Avenue. We have one more caller sneaking in here in the last hour. All right, caller, how, how are you doing out there? Yes, greetings, fam. Everything is well. How are you all? Doing great. How you doing, Jomo? I'm well. Just a, a quick comment. Um, August 17th, uh, Marcus Garvey's uh, birthday, 130th anniversary. Uh, Dr. Johnson, um, I know you know, uh, yesterday in Jamaica, they had a very large Marcus Garvey celebration. Uh, you were there a year ago. Can you talk to us um, on this last uh, few minutes about the importance of us recognizing our own power and taking things into our own control mm -hmm. and removing it from them to us or I and I, where it's us, our creator, our destiny, and removing it from other people's hands. Just talk to us about that with education and creating our own schools and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Okay. Indeed, I would argue that most of what we suffer from is profoundly psychological. You know, one of the reasons why we continue to walk in this quicksand and take one step forward, three step backwards, is because we start to realize that the issue is not resources, it's not education, it's not numbers. The only resource we're lacking in is in the psychological resources, the courage, the commitment, the consistency, the accountability, the compassion, the camaraderie, it's all in the psychological 
that's where we're losing. You know, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, miseducation of the Negro, he talked about it. You know, if you, if you, if you control a man's thinking, you don't have to determine whether he goes to the back door or not. He'll go to the back door on his own. And when he gets to the back of the door, if there is one, he will make his own to walk out of mm-hmm. it. And of course, the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey said, without confidence in yourself, you're quite defeated in the race of life. With confidence, you have won even before you have started. And that's why I believe the road back to redemption begins with two E's, education and economics. Economics, absolutely. So listen, we only got about 26 seconds left, even not even quite that. Uh, we're talking about Dr. Johnson is going to be in Buffalo at St. Luke's AME Zion Church. Uh, it's going to be at 4 o'clock, uh, 314 East Ferry Street. All children uh, 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 under age 18 and all adults over, over 65 uh, can come in for free. Uh, everyone else, I don't know what the price is. for $25. $25 for adults. Uh, for those in between, we're hoping to see hundreds of us there. That's why we went to this venue rather than going to the library because we needed to have enough space for all of the people that ought to be coming to help us uh, to focus on this issue. This is the number one threat facing us right now. We are losing generation after generation after generation, and they're getting more and more successful in ass- assassinating these generations. And so we have to fight. We have to fight now. We have to fight with urgency. Dr. Johnson, I really appreciate all of the work that you do and all of the insight that you shared. I know you had a lot more you're going to be able to share with us when you're in Buffalo. Oh, without question, looking forward to it. Again, thanks to Sister Patricia for helping to get the word out. Thank and you, thanks Dr. to Johnson. you, my brother, for having me back on the show. I want to get you all, give you all greetings from your brothers and sisters down here in Nat Turner land. I'm in Drury Real, Virginia. As you know, today is the 186th anniversary of the Nat Turner War. It's also the anniversary of the Haitian Revolution. It is also the anniversary of the George Jackson Prison War. All and right. the anniversary of my birth. So in just a few short yeah. moments, I'm going to be heading over to the very land where Nat Turner waged the bloodiest slave revolt in American history. And we'll right. be observing the total solar eclipse together okay. as we remember the great ancestor Nat right. Turner they're, they're, and his they're, army. They're kicking me out. We'll talk to you soon, Dr. Johnson. Yes, sir. All Take right. care, my brother. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to today's program on Living Now with L. Nathan Hare. If you would like to share your questions and comments or would like a copy of today's show, please send your emails to livingnow at lnathanhare.com or send us a fax at 881-2927. We'll be back next week with another inspirational program on Living Now.